Welcome everybody to the Motherhood Center's Maternal Mental Health Awareness Event. Uh, today is a very important day. As many of you know, this is World Maternal Mental Health Awareness Day and May is Maternal Mental Health Awareness Month. My name is Paige Bellenbaum and I'm the founding director of the Motherhood Center and I'm joined by CEO and medical director and co-founder, Dr. Katherine Berndorf. We're gonna be kicking off this morning um, with the full of, uh, event of wonderful speakers that we have um, that are gonna come after us um, for the rest of the day. Uh, it's amazing the outpouring of interest um, that has come because of this event. We have over 700 people that have registered to be a part of today's event and hear from some, some world-renowned experts. And I, I wanna stress that number because it really speaks to the fact that I think we are in a time where maternal mental health is really starting to finally matter. And the outpouring of, of registrations and, and people that have shown interest in this event really, really speaks to that. I wanna start really briefly by talking about why today is such an important day. Uh, one in five new and expecting mothers experience what we call a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder. The acronym for that is PMAD. And you'll hear a lot of our speakers refer to PMADs throughout the course of today's event. Um, it's otherwise known as postpartum depression. Uh, and we'll, we'll hear a little bit more about what actually falls under the umbrella of PMADs when some of our first panelists begin to tell us more. Uh, one in five women experience a PMAD. And for those of us who do this work, we know it's actually more like one in three especially right now in the time of coronavirus. The amount of calls and inquiries and support requests that we've been getting at the Motherhood Center and, and other clinical facilities around the world that specialize in treating PMATs has gone up exponentially because this is a very vulnerable time, especially for new and expecting mothers. PMATs are the number one complication associated with childbirth. Uh, more so than gestational diabetes and some of the other things that all pregnant women are tested for. PMADs are the number one complication. So that's why today is so important because so many new and expecting moms are either experiencing a PMAD right now, might have already experienced one or may experience one in the future. We need to know what they are, we need to know what to look for, and we need to know where to go for help. And if it's not happening to us, it might be impacting someone that we know. Today, we are gonna be joined by uh, world-renowned experts in the field of maternal mental health, obstetrics, relationships. We have authors, and we are gonna be joined later on today by very special guest, Gabby Bernstein. A few minutes about my journey and, and why I came to this work. I am a survivor of severe postpartum depression and anxiety myself. Uh, 13 years ago when my son was born, um, I had the most debilitating depression of my life, um, and I consider myself very lucky to be here today. Um, I was able to get connected to treatment and help. Um, through therapy and medication, I got better, and it really became a lifelong journey of mine to make sure that women who are struggling get the care and support that they deserve and need to get to the other side of this. And I think one thing that we will learn, if nothing else today, is how treatable perinatal mood and anxiety disorders are. Once we can connect women with treatment, they will feel better, they can feel better, and they can resume a relationship with their new baby, the one that they always hoped for. So I'm going to uh, turn this over now to Dr. Katherine Berndorf. Um, and Dr. Berndorf, uh, if you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself and about the Motherhood Center and, and what it's all about. Thanks Paige and um, welcome to everyone today. I just wanna say that I get chills every time you talk about your, why you're here, that you're here and this amazing journey that you've been on to um, partner with me in, uh, in creating this amazing space, the Motherhood Center, which is now virtual. Um, I apologize if I'm, um, if I'm echoing, hopefully not. Um, but what I'd like to say is um, the Motherhood Center was a long time uh, coming, uh, sort of the culmination of my um, academic journey, always interested in, in women's health. I couldn't decide in medical school if I should be an OBGYN or a psychiatrist and decided essentially to marry the two. 
um, most interested in sort of treating the emotional side of the reproductive spectrum, the, the journey of women from menses through menopause, and now most focused on the perinatal period before, during, and after pregnancy, which is what the motherhood center really is all about. So um, place, it's a community, it's a treatment center. Uh, it is, it's like a, um, an urban Zen womb in the middle of Manhattan, if you can believe it right now. It's sitting there, unfortunately empty at the moment, but we'll be back. And now we're, we're living virtually and just figuring out how to do this thing. But what it is, is um, a place of support from um, the highest level of treatment, which is our day program, where women who are the most acute in terms of their illness, their PMAD, um, are struggling and need support and treatment every day, right? Five hours a day, five days a week, they come, we have an on-site nursery, and we take care of them in, in many ways. Um, we say sometimes it's like mothering the mother, right? We are helping these women become the mothers that they dream of being, get back to being who they, who they want to be. And in the middle of um, our treatment spectrum, we have outpatient support, we have um, therapies, group therapies, uh, and individual, family, all kinds of things, all related to perinatal mental health. And then we have support groups and education. Paige runs a twice weekly support group that is highly attended and we're getting more and more um, uh, different kinds of groups going to meet the need. One wonderful thing about the Motherhood Center, we're not in an academic institution. I, I was always part of an academic institution and we came to be in a, um, uh, in a non-academic, uh, non-hospital space so that we could create this warm environment. Um, and I think it's really um, been a fun, exciting project that has turned into something, you know, it, it's become something unbelievable. And um, you're gonna hear from a lot of people today who have been there, and you're gonna be hear from a lot of people today, especially in this first panel, who literally paved the way, who are my mentors, um, and friends and colleagues now who created the feel of both support and um, you know treatment and did the research towards understanding this better and they really represent the pillars of what is the motherhood center today and i am forever grateful so with that paige i'll turn it back to you and Thank you, Dr. Berndorf. Um, so I want to just go over a couple of ground rules first, um, just so that everybody's clear on, on how today is going to flow. We have three panels. After the first two panels, we will be joined uh, by Gabby Bernstein at around 1220, and she'll be with us until about 1240, 1245. Um, I just wanted to let people know uh, that if you do have a question, this is, we're on the webinar function of Zoom. And so there's two functions at the bottom, there's chat and there's Q&A. If you do have a question for one of the panelists, please use the Q&A question or the Q&A function. We will do our best to get to every question. I can't guarantee we will be able to get to every question because if 700 people ask a question, it's hard to gonna be hard to field them all. Um, but we are committed to getting your questions answered. So if you don't have your question answered, please feel free to message us on Instagram, to call, um, to send us an email, um, and we're, we're happy to get back to you with a response. Um, we're going to try to leave those questions for the last 15 minutes of the panel, um, and that's when we'll be able to try and, and sift through as many as possible. Uh, wanted to let people know that this event is being recorded, and it will be available to watch some of, all of, by the end of this week, it'll be up on the website. And so for everybody who did register, we'll be sending out a subsequent email, just thank you, thanking you for coming, participating, and providing you with information on where you can locate the recorded version of this webinar. Um, so what I would like to do now is, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Catherine for a minute. Um, I'm gonna be moderating the last two panels today. And Catherine is going to be moderating the first panel, which we are going to be starting in just about five minutes. Great. So before we get started, um, I would like to just read you the bio of my colleague and founding director and dear friend, um, Paige Bellenbaum, right next to me. Uh, Paige, who's an LMSW, 
is the founding director and chief external relations officer at the Motherhood Center. She started her social work career working at a homeless shelter for families in San Francisco, where she built a multi-million dollar housing and aftercare program for families transitioning from homelessness to permanent housing. She then moved to New York City in 2000 to get her master's of social work at Columbia. After she graduated, she held executive level positions at various nonprofits, including the Center for Family Life, located in Brooklyn, Habitat for Humanity in New York City, and Settlement Housing Fund. Throughout her nonprofit career, she's worked with homeless families, victims of domestic violence and child abuse, and formerly homeless single mothers, as well as formerly incarcerated young adults. She chaired the Youth and Human Services Committee of Community Board 6 in Brooklyn for six years and ran for public office and was elected in 2015 as the district leader for the 52nd Assembly District in Brooklyn, which she held for four years. After her first child was born, Paige suffered from severe postpartum depression that nearly ended her life. Once she began to heal, she became committed to fighting for education, screening, and treatment for postpartum depression so that no more women would have to suffer silently. She drafted legislation in New York State that was championed by Senator Liz Krueger, mandating education and strongly encouraging all of new and expecting mothers that was just signed into law, that was signed into law, sorry, in 2014. Paige has been an outspoken advocate on the issue of postpartum depression and uses her own story as a tool for change. She's appeared on the Today Show, NPR, PBS NewsHour, and in Women's Health Magazines, The Journal, and several other media outlets. I'm so proud of you, Paige, and so happy to be here with you today. Thanks, Dr. Berndorf. I couldn't be happier to be here today, too. And now it's my great honor to introduce you as our moderator of the first panel and do a brief um, intro of the other panelists that are joining us. <clears throat> if you are a part of panel one, I encourage you um, to join us now um, with your video. And as soon as we start the panel, you can um, turn your audio on as well. So if any of our first panelists are here with us, um, there's Wendy, hi. <clears throat> so it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Katherine Berndorf. She's the co-founder and medical director of the Motherhood Center of New York. Dr. Berndorf is founding director of the Payne Whitney Women's Program at the New York Presbyterian Hospital, Weill Cornell Medical Center, where she is an associate professor of psychiatry and obstetrics and gynecology. A graduate of Smith College, Dr. Berndorf attended Brown University Medical School and completed her residency at New York Presbyterian Hospital. Dr. Berndorf has served on the board and is currently on the President's Advisory Council of Postpartum Support International. In 2019, she co-authored her second book entitled, What No One Tells You, A Guide to Your Emotions During Pregnancy and Motherhood. We will also be joined today by Dr. Lee Cohen. He is the founder and director of the Amon Pinizado Center for Women's Mental Health at Massachusetts General Hospital the Associate Chief of Psychiatry for Philanthropy and Departmental Communications, and the Edmund N. and Carol M. Carpenter Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He is an international leader in women's mental health and was among the founders of the field of perinatal and reproductive psychiatry. His work spans the domains of research, teaching, and clinical care in the treatment of mood and anxiety disorders, especially those associated with female reproductive function. Dr. Cohen received his medical degree from Albany Medical College and completed his residency and a fellowship in psychopharmacology at Massachusetts General Hospital. Wendy Davis, PhD, is the Executive Director of Postpartum Support International, uh, acronym PSI, and lives in Portland, Oregon. Wendy leads PSI's delivery of vital perinatal mental health services, support to families, training for providers, and perinatal mental health advocacy. Wendy began her career as a psychotherapist and began specializing in perinatal mental health after recovering from postpartum depression and anxiety herself. She specializes in developing perinatal mental health systems that integrate social support, referral, and professional expertise, which is at the core of PSI's services and her own recovery. Sonia Murdoch is the executive director and co-founder of the Postpartum Resource Center of New York a nonprofit statewide organization which has been serving New York State families since 1998 and has been recognized internationally as a model of perinatal mental health social support network. Sonia is a board member of Marseille of North America, 
serves as the lead New York State Coordinator for Postpartum Support International, and is also a past president of Postpartum Support International. So before I turn this over to Catherine, um, I just want to encourage um, all of our panelists uh, that are with us today to join. And I just want everybody to know, um, we are, you are looking at the leaders in the field of, of maternal mental health. So I just wanna give a profound thank you to all of you for taking the time to being with us today on this very special day of World Maternal Mental Health Awareness Day. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Berndorf, um, to ask these very distinguished panelists some questions about perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Thanks, Paige, and welcome to Dr. Lee Cohen, Dr. Wendy Davis, and Sonia Murdoch. Um, I, Lee, you may have missed your, uh, your intro, your distinguished intro, intro, though you may have heard it. Um, but I, like Paige said, I, I literally, I have goosebumps. I, my heart is racing. I, you guys defined the field. We're literally looking at the biopsychosocial model, right, from Angle. You guys are it, change makers and part of a movement that um, began, certainly, began my journey into this. You guys were here and and doing it and I am forever grateful and, and anyone who's on this webinar has the pleasure of knowing you, having worked with you, been mentored, and now have you as colleagues, friends, and um, just knows you. you know, you're all one in addition to being brilliant and and changing the landscape and making improvements uh, for women and families and children and generations everywhere, you are kind, lovely, warm people. And so that is no small thing in this, um, in this world. So thank you for joining us and being here today. I am, um, can you tell I'm beyond excited? <laughs> you gotta calm down. Okay, so thank you for being here. And um, you know, this is, I, I, we have questions and I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw some things out, but I would really love uh, just given who you are in this field, if you could talk a little bit about your journeys. And so um, I have you first here, Lee, but I would love if you could sort of, in your journey, sort of weave in the, the biological piece, Wendy, the psychological piece, Sonia, the social piece, but like, who are you? How did you get here? And, 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 and tell us a little bit about your journey into uh, perinatal or for you, reproductive and perinatal mental health, Lee. Uh-oh, mute. You're on. Oh, there you are. I got unmuted. First of all, uh, Catherine and colleagues and Paige, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, we've learned over these last eight weeks, everybody has had, um, you know, their own uh, sort of private or family challenges. Uh, navigating uh, the last several months has, has really been an extraordinary experience. Uh, but I can speak for myself and my colleagues in our center and that we've we've derived so much support um, from the field, from our colleagues across the country. Um, uh, and uh, as we uh, actually do virtual rounds uh, and uh, use telehealth to engage with colleagues across the country. And it's it, in a way, it's been a unique opportunity and it's been a very special uh, form of support for us. So I, I just hope that uh, for everyone who's listening today, that people are staying safe and, and uh, are, are healthy and, uh, and, uh, and that we, I think we'll have better times ahead of us. Uh, and uh, so, but, but to your question, Catherine, and I, I won't speak for too long, but I'll, I'll say that uh, I, I have a, a sort of, as I thought back a little bit, as you were talking about sort of my own entree into this work, um, uh, trained as a psychiatrist, trained as a, a psychopharmacologist by subspecialty. Uh, and then as I was finishing training, it being a remarkable time in our field in psychiatry, where we were learning that uh, mood and anxiety disorders were chronic relapsing uh, illnesses, uh, where if you stopped medication, uh, patients uh, relapse. We learned that in depression, bipolar disorder, and that was sort of just at the end of my uh, chief residency uh, in psychiatry at Mass General. And uh, I, uh, I had this idea and, and got some, uh, you know, sort of mentoring from uh, leaders in our field uh, that, you know, uh, it was interesting that women who were present, reproductive age women who were now doing really well on their medicines, uh, 
<clears throat> didn't have clear guidance as to what to do with respect to their wishes to get pregnant. And so we started this small consultation service at MGH for women and their doctors as they were thinking about using, whether it was antidepressants or mood stabilizers or lithium for patients with bipolar disorder. Um, and that, uh, and that, be, that was sort of very new. Um, and I remember being told by senior colleagues, uh, perhaps um, I should think of a different uh, fellowship or subspecialty interest because women did so well during pregnancy. That was sort of the party line at that time. Uh, but we found that women who stopped their antidepressants or their mood st stabilizers during pregnancy didn't do very well. In fact, they relapsed and we went on to sort of study that and publish that. And, um, but it was really um, a sense of, um, in a way, a mission of uh, keeping women healthy during pregnancy that sort of got us going and has sustained us. Um, and it turned out that keeping women well during pregnancy was the one, also one of the strongest predictors of postpartum depression. And um, sort of our work expanded to pregnancy, postpartum disease, um, the spectrum of postpartum psychiatric disorder, uh, safety of lactation. Um, and it's been so um, satisfying to see the evolution and the growth of the field and also the growth of the science because we had sparse science at the beginning. It was sort of, so in some sense, clinical intuition and what we thought was good clinical care. And then now over the last 20 years plus to see more science sort of guiding what we ultimately recommend to uh, patients. Um, and I, if I was to sort of summarize, or people ask me, what's like the single most important thing that you've learned in and more years than I want to actually admit to of taking care of this population of patients. But if, if there's a single thing that I, I've, I, I teach and I, I, I sort of take to heart when I'm sitting with patients or, or lecturing to colleagues, frankly, it's that at the end of the day, nothing is more important than keeping women uh, psychiatrically and emotionally well uh, during pregnancy, whether it be with pharmacologic tools and then also partnering in a way that we could not do early on with colleagues, uh, whether you know organizations the, like PSI and community-based support groups, and using our colleagues in psychology, using evidence-based non-pharmacologic therapies, um, has also evolved uh, to help keep women well during pregnancy and during the postpartum period. So that's sort of how I got in and why I'm still uh, sort of so committed to this. Uh, to this work. Thank you, Lee. Amazing. Thank you for your mentorship all those years ago and still just defining, paving the way here. So, um, Wendy, I'll go to you next. Also, a colleague, friend, mentor, and someone who has changed the face of, of uh, perinatal reproductive health in the country and internationally with PSI, which is an amazing organization, as Lee said, that's really bringing together so many different pieces of the puzzle. So maybe you could talk a little bit about your, your journey here and um, what you're up to. I'm happy to, and thank you so much, Motherhood Center, for inviting me at the wee hours of the morning here. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Oregon. You know I love you a lot. Uh, I'm here. I got dressed for you guys, so that's all good. Thank um, you. I'm, I'm Wendy Davis. Um, I'm so happy to be here. I'm the executive director of Postpartum Support International, as you heard. And so how did I get involved in this field? Um, well, the, you know, the beginning of the story is that I come from a really large family, a wonderful large family. I'm one of five uh, in my original family and one of nine um, in my combined family. Um, I always thought that being a mom would be part of my life. It would be wonderful and uh, you'll be so good at being a mom and all that. But as I grew up and I, I got excited about my own career path and my own identity, there was a point where I thought, well, you know, I thought I always thought I'd have kids, but I'm really enjoying this career of psychology. So um, I really delved into learning as much as I could about psychology. And from the beginning, I was always interested in a holistic view of mental health. I majored in psychobiology um, before it was really a common thing as an undergrad. I just was always interested in that. And I started a career as, as a psychologist 
Um, but not in perinatal mental health, which for one thing, didn't exist as a field, um, as Lee said, longer than I want to, you know, like to admit, but, but always, how does the brain and the body work together was always interesting. But I, I specialized in depression and anxiety and transitions and creative process. That was my specialty. So um, I worked with lots of parents. I worked with lots of people, you know, struggling with these mental health and mood disorders. But it wasn't until I had my own child after I decided, you know what, good career. Now I also really want to have a baby. And when I had my first child, I got a crash course in postpartum depression. And well, for one thing, nothing, nothing will teach you more about psychobiology and the holistic need for um, different parts of our recovery than suffering with um, depression, anxiety, insomnia, panic attacks, and all the things that I was experiencing as a new mom. And despite being a specialist, working for years with depression, anxiety, and panic attacks, insomnia, like I worked with all that. When I, this is what was so profound and changed my life, changed the course of my career, and fuels everything I do now, is that when I was depressed, I didn't recognize it as depression. The power of that and the impact of understanding if I as a specialist who really kind of love to think about how to help people and how I wasn't afraid of depression, anxiety, either in myself, which I had had before, or in my clients, how did I, once I became a mother and was having all the same symptoms, never even recognized it as depression, that's because of the impact, not just of the symptoms of depression where your thoughts are skewed and you feel helpless and hopeless, but the profound impact and stigma of having these symptoms when you have a baby, when everyone has told you your whole life, you'll be such a good mom. And then when it happens, not even recognizing, as I always say, like being a meteorologist, landing in the middle of a hurricane and not recognizing what it was. Yeah. And because of those symptoms and blaming myself, now I know at the core of my recovery and the core of what PSI does is that we have to address the shame and embarrassment and fear that women and men feel in pregnancy and postpartum mood disorders and post loss. Because now that we have doctors Berndorf and Cohen, like now that we have organizations like the Postpartum Resource Center of New York and all of these colleagues, now there's so much treatment, there's so many articles, there's so many websites, so much help, but nothing will still let that mama who was like me reach out to those if she doesn't even know what she has, and that's what changed my life. And so I am devoted, yes, I really still love psychology, psychobiology, but I'm devoted to that holistic cure that reaches into the shame and, and that was my life saving path to recognize this is not about love and whether I love my baby, this is about health and mental health. And if I get that fixed, <laughs> that's what I thought at the time, if I relieve those symptoms, I know that I might get through this. Never did I imagine that I would be here a couple years later. <laughs> my PPD baby is 25. And such a beautiful young man and my uh, not PPD uh, second child is 22 and a beautiful young woman and never did I imagine I'd be up at um, 7 30 in Portland time to, to be here on this amazing in this amazing experience with you guys oh, thank you Wendy that's a powerful story and I think echoes that of many um uh, Paige was saying you know she's a social worker as well it's it's remarkable how well trained you can be in the field and not recognize what's happening for you personally i hear this over and over again and and to your point and when lee started you know the science of this and the organizations like PSI and, and the Resource Center of New York were just getting started. I mean, no one was talking about it. This was taboo. This was shameful. This still is shameful. The reason we're having this today is to help defeat the stigma and decrease the shame. But I mean, this is going to be the theme throughout because why it still exists, you know, we can talk about. But um, 
for a moment. Sonia, could you tell us your story and how you come to be uh, a leader in this field? Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Want to make sure. Um, this is such a special occasion and a huge thank you to Dr. Berndorf and Paige and to the Motherhood Center um, to be having such an important event today for maternal mental um, health awareness and internationally the importance of sharing this information. I came to this very unexpectedly and it's almost a surreal experience being with you all here today and on a panel here with Dr. Cohen and with Wendy Davis. And I want to say I'm very grateful to be with everybody here today and I hope that everybody is safe and well. I very unexpectedly came to this, and as you shared with everybody, what I um, represent, my area really is peer support, social support. And when my sister and brother-in-law were expecting their first baby, this is when, um, this was the first baby in a new generation. So everybody was so super excited. And uh, I created something called Cloud 10. So it wasn't even a happiness at cloud nine. I was on cloud 10. I couldn't wait to be a first time aunt. I couldn't wait for that baby to come. So um, here it was, my um, very sweet niece was born and we were all so, so excited. That three weeks was probably one of the happiest time frames in my whole family's life. But unfortunately, three weeks later, our nightmare began as a family. And one morning, my sister went screaming and running out of the house. And here she ends up being brought to the emergency room. And later that day, she was admitted to the psychiatric unit at the same hospital that she gave birth at three weeks before. So no one was explaining to us what she had. She just had a baby. And now um, she was seeing things, hearing things that weren't there. She was paranoid. Nobody was able to tell us what was going on. And from that experience, we as a family, we were very confused. Like, what is this? What does she have? And with um, the experience that she was going through, we didn't know anything about maternal mental health besides maybe the baby blues. Even at that time, we probably didn't even know the name Baby Blues. We just knew when a new mom has a baby, she can be kind of weepy, very emotional for a while. That was it. We didn't have a clue about maternal mental health. And unfortunately, at the time, neither did the mental community that we were coming across. So my sister, she's upstairs suffering in a psychiatric unit. I'm down on my knees in a hospital chapel mm -hmm praying for my sister to, um, to get well and us not knowing what this was. My sister was very afraid. She was in a psychiatric unit with many different people, with many different mental conditions that they were battling. And we didn't understand it because she had just had a baby. So I supported my sister through postpartum psychosis and severe postpartum depression. We're very, very grateful that and blessed that she recovered and that my brother-in-law my sister have a strong marriage my niece today is awesome and we're very grateful for the help that we received um, and that help at the time was through postpartum support international and the founder jane honickman so my way of giving back then was to create a statewide nonprofit called the Postpartum Resource Center of New York. So uh, this is um, my life's journey now, and I'm very grateful that it started with, we say it started with the birth of a baby and supporting a sister, but now having that opportunity to work with partners such as the Motherhood Center, PSI, all different folks all throughout New York State that we all come together with um, supporting these moms and families and to make sure that lives are saved and building happy families. 
It's an amazing story, Sonia. Again, chills all morning. <laughs> Um, it's great. I, I, you hear the theme, right? And we see this at the motherhood center a lot where, um, and Paige says this, when she got well, she got angry, she got motivated, she was just wanted to make a difference. And both of you know, we're all sort of saying the same thing. And uh, it's really uh, motivating to have an experience that changes your life and where you can see a path forward to make a difference for people in the future. And I, it's, it's remarkable. So thank you for the work that you do. Well, thank you. Uh, so um, back to Lee, if you could um, just give us a brief overview of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, kind of what they are um, as a whole. I know that's a huge question, but just a, an overview for, the, for those to sort of set up the day. Oh, you're on mute, Lee. You're on mute. Sure. So. Um... You know, we could spend uh, the whole day uh, yeah. as we have, and and there are courses now, and and now actually more and more uh, digital opportunities to sort of learn about uh, postpartum mood and anxiety disorders. Um, but when I think about sort of postpartum, uh, uh, first I'll talk about mood disorders, and then just a little bit about anxiety disorders. Um, I think about a spectrum of uh, illness. Uh, there was reference just even in these first minutes about sort of postpartum blues. 85% of women have uh, some modest reactivity of mood in the first days or week uh, postpartum. Uh, but uh, on the other side of that, and, and that is not pathologic, uh, that is typically transient by definition. Um, but uh, when I think about uh, postpartum uh, mood disorder, I really think about sort of prevailing depressive symptoms, meeting criteria for major depression, uh, that becomes uh, enduring and is not just some sort of mild reactivity of uh, mood and also uh, occurs along a spectrum of uh, severity. Um, I think that earlier on, and frankly, it's because of work that Sonia's done and Wendy's done and, and also lay organizations and also uh, efforts to decrease stigma that um, patients across a severity of symptoms uh, are more and more recognized uh, and getting a, a spectrum of treatments. Um, I think we're, we're critical uh, in, in the Center for Women's Mental Health a little bit um, when, when it comes to sort of some of the treatments that women get because we think that uh, it's not one size fits all. And we th what, what concerns us, frankly, is that women get treated who are suffering with um, evidence-based therapies, whether it be pharmacologic or non-pharmacologic. And uh, although uh, certainly the uh, bulk of, of my research and my clinical work has been in navigating safely, for example, depression during pregnancy and its treatment, um, some of our even more recent over the last decade, our work has been in non-pharmacologic therapies, whether it be a cognitive behavioral therapy or other treatments that have been shown to be efficacious uh, for the treatment of, of postpartum uh, depression. Uh, and then actually, as Sonia mentioned, we're very interested in, uh, although it may not be as common, obviously, uh, in postpartum psychosis, because postpartum psychosis is the most serious uh, form of postpartum uh, mood disorder or postpartum psychiatric illness in terms of affective disorder, mood disorder, and uh, really requires um, expeditious treatment, uh, almost unequivocally in a hospital, um, and uh, where uh, so that we uh, keep moms safe and we keep babies uh, safe. And uh, we are, uh, I, can, I can almost never think of, an, uh, of a situation where I've been involved with a patient with postpartum um, psychosis who doesn't get hospitalized. And one thing I, I've learned uh, by my participation in the postpartum psychosis task force uh, that really is under the aegis of PSI um, has been how, and, and Sonia does tell us a little bit with your comment that um, how alone women can feel uh, in the community, and we've seen this now across America, because uh, the experience of even our colleagues out in the field managing postpartum psychosis, um, and then uh, how to counsel those women on the other side of an acute episode in terms of longer term treatments. It's one of our sort of newer areas of interest uh, as we set up the MGH postpartum psychosis project to sort of work with 
women and work with our colleagues to enhance uh, people's ability to manage women with what we consider to be the most serious form of uh, postpartum psychiatric disorder in my mind. And then, and then just because I want to make sure we leave plenty of time for others, but um, I think that uh, a less studied but equally important area has been postpartum anxiety disorders. Mm -hmm. I think, and I'm, I'm a little reluctant to mention this because I think our group was the first group to describe postpartum OCD, and I'm not putting the uh, date on that paper because it was a long time ago, but it was women who had intrusive obsessional thoughts to harm their babies and they were not psychotic and they had OCD basically uh, manifesting in the postpartum period. And we wrote about how effective it would be to use high dose uh, SSRIs to treat postpartum OCD. And I'm so pleased to see an increased appreciation of postpartum anxiety, postpartum, uh, whether it be panic disorder or generalized anxiety disorder or OCD, because I think what we have seen as a field and anybody who takes care of patients and you all take care of patients uh, day in, day out, is that there's so much commingling of mood and anxiety disorder uh, during pregnancy and during the postpartum period that we find that if you don't treat both, um, that it's tough to get women uh, well. And so we've actually found that uh, both uh, careful attention to um, optimal management of both the mood and the anxiety disorder and folding in community-based support groups or other sorts of, or, or uh, adjunctive cognitive behavioral therapy. I, I am excited today practicing because of, we have more tools. They're community-based tools. They're, tools. they're tools that our psychology colleagues have, uh, which are evidence-based um, and, uh, and, and, and frankly, a, a refined algorithm in terms of how to safely use medicine. I'm inspired today because I think we have more tools to get women well uh, who are suffering from uh, postpartum mood and anxiety disorders. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and I would just add, it's funny you say postpartum. I've been trying, I've, I've been training myself to say perinatal because it, it's what I've found, and I don't know if you guys find this as well up in Boston, that postpartum, sometimes people exclude themselves, right? They'll be like, I, I'm pregnant. Can I be having a postpartum episode? And it's funny, I often say like, you're actually having it already. So if we treat you in pregnancy, you're not going to have it after pregnancy, right? So I don't know. The nomenclature always makes me a little nuts. Um, it's hard to say perinatal. I think people recognize postpartum, um, postpartum depression as the preeminent sort of uh, illness. But but I, I would say I'm trying very hard to say perinatal so that we can be as inclusive as possible because the person who is anxious and pregnant and suffering um, or postpartum and psychotic or you know any version of that is within the category is someone who needs treatment right and um to your point everything seems quite commingled i don't know if you want to that i i think that one of the reasons that i mean the focus of our initial work for 15 years frankly was in taking care of psychiatric real pregnant pregnant uh, yeah. pregnant women and um one of the reasons i think it's a, you know so, well, several reasons why it's so critical to be managing um psychiatric disorder during pregnancy yeah. is that nothing predicts postpartum psychiatric disorder more than the presence of illness during uh, pregnancy. And one of the reasons I think it poses a particular challenge is because obviously the concerns about reproductive safety of medications, which, which uh, now we have tremendous amounts of information about, we, it's not like we know everything, but we know a lot more than we did. Right. Um, and, but I also think it takes collaboration with our colleagues in OB, pediatrics, um, and psychiatry are in the community as we're managing in a way what's a, uh, from a practical point of view, a more challenging period when we're taking care of depression during pregnancy, yeah. because I think it's so critical that the uh, relevant clinicians be on the same page. Because you can imagine, this is challenging enough for women, uh, you know, just sort of uh, having this experience, but if there's a disconnect, if there's not good communication between the uh, clinicians involved in the care of that patient, um, then it can be, I think, particularly confusing and particularly challenging and actually can get in the way of women getting well during pregnancy, which again is the strongest predictor of how they'll do postpartum.
Well, it brings up a really interesting point that, that um, often when women are pregnant, um, they are told one thing by an OB and another thing by a psychiatrist or a support network that's saying you need help and it might include medication, right? And then there's a, the conundrum, who do I listen to? Who do I trust? And I find to your point, when we're collaborating, as this panel shows, it, it's so much, uh, it's better for everyone. And I think, looks like you want to say something, but yeah, I, it, collaboration is, is so essential. And uh, I think treatment during pregnancy um, is, is, to me, that's how I think. I think of you as, you know, the medicine, I send everybody up to, to your Mass General site, which is so incredibly informative, both for clinicians and for patients and families, to get the, the latest in terms of your, um, the blogs on sort of what's the latest with Prozac in pregnancy, what's the safest medication, you know, for that person, you know, it's, it's just, you're doing a tremendous job to help defeat that stigma in pregnancy and educate colleagues of all sorts about um, treatment. And I'd be curious what uh, Wendy and Sonia feel. You know, uh, we have so many patients, you know, in an internet age who go to various uh, resources. And as you know, uh, in a way, the reliability or accuracy of those resources is so variable. And so, Wendy, when I send somebody to the PSI website, I, I have a, a high level of confidence because I know how you curate, curate the material on, on PSI. When Ruta Nonax, who's our editor-in-chief, uh, of womensmentalhealth.org post something on womensmentalhealth.org. We know about the quality and the rigor of her evaluation of what's going on the website. I think it's very challenging for patients, it goes to Catherine's point, who are navigating sort of what they should be doing and, and yet uh, in a way sort of the good news is that they're out there in the community, they're engaging with others, but, but folks are sometimes accessing information resources that um, you know, really only maybe partially accurate. For sure, and I would I would turn that to you, Wendy. Um, you know, what do you what do you suggest, and and how do people use PSI? Can you tell us a little bit more about it, and and some of the resources and uh, that that patients and families can find? Absolutely, sure. Thank you. I'm really enjoying this conversation, um, and I uh, postpartum support international PSI is um, at its core, it was founded by Jane Honickman in California, and at its core was developed as a place both to provide social support to people who need help, assistance, and comfort, you know, um, in pregnancy and postpartum uh, mental health distress. So none of that includes a diagnosis. Right, and I just want to say that first because I think it's really important to this whole question, both about treatment, about prevalence, which we'll talk about, and you'll talk about all day, and about recovery, is that um, a diagnosis is a really important part of this field, but it isn't where we start as families, as women, and as providers. We start with that first conversation, that first reach out, and that recognition before diagnosis of those things on the website those symptoms sound like what I have or what my sister and my daughter, my wife um, has. And so what PSI does is to provide social support to families through lots of services at no cost to families. Um, our helpline, 800-944-4PPD, which we used to be Depression After Deliveries line, 944-4773, uh, our online groups and our so support coordinators, state support coordinators, as Sonia is, um, and all, all of those services in English and Spanish every day to families. That is at the core of PSI, is really having those services and, and delivery to reach, reach families like that, pregnant and postpartum and post-pregnancy and infant loss. So it's important to know that, as you said, Catherine, really, um, as we've developed to understand that pregnancy is just as important at the time to reach and to support and to help um, women and their families as the postpartum period. But as we developed, as PSI developed, realized we have to start training people. <laughs> so we have places to send the mamas and the daddies to. So then we started developing more services for providers. So that's the second thing that PSI does is train providers 
providers, everything from uh, social support providers that um, Sonia and I both are and in our hearts, like with that will always be part of us, to uh, childbirth professionals, to psychotherapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, and and more recently in the last three or four years, really starting to focus in now on training frontline providers, medical primary care providers, and where I'm as so we're all so excited about finally it feels like finally we're starting to collaborate with what we've all known from the beginning, which is integrating mental health treatment with social support and primary care is what's going to move us forward. So PSI does curate um, what we have on our website. We also curate what we train, what we teach. And maybe people say, well, why, why didn't you leave in that part? And think, well, we, we don't have enough evidence-based research on that yet. However, we do have a lot of um, practice, you know, evidence, practice-based evidence as well. And we don't want to disregard that. And I really agree with you, Dr. Cohen, that we have to really look at what's evidence-based. And then we're also such a new and developing field. This is also how we've all learned. How you learned and started to articulate obsessive compulsive disorders and the intrusive thoughts was practice-based evidence. And we want to also really um, acknowledge and appreciate that. So that's PSI. I think, um, unless I've forgotten something, the other thing we do is just we, we collaborate and we um, really want to be that support for other organizations and groups around the world. And we're um, proud to do so. I, 10 years ago, there was one employee at PSI and I didn't become, they didn't have an executive director until I became the first one 10 years ago. And now we have 15 employees and all kinds of amazing collaborators and uh, people who help us there. And it's been amazing to watch that growth, but we couldn't do it without, um, without our colleagues here, without our colleagues right here and people watching too, I'm sure. Thanks, Wendy. I love how you say that practice-based evidence versus evidence-based medicine or practice. That's a really interesting, I had not thought of that, sort of flipping it and sort of saying, what are we learning from what we're doing? That so informs, you know, uh, the kinds of research that we do and the treatment that we give. It's really important. Um, so thanks for, thanks for that. And um, Sonia, with the postpartum, um, with the resource center, I'm curious, um, what kind of calls do you get and who are you hearing from? And I just wonder if you might talk a little bit about what you're doing, you know, who you hear from and, and how you can help women. Sure. Um, also to, let's see, um, address what Dr. Cohen has uh, spoken about before as well as Wendy. I do want to say with the, um, the term perinatal mood and anxiety disorders here in New York, what we hear from moms in our state here, New York mamas, they want to tell it like it is. They want to hear it like it is. So we do use perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. And we are happy um, to have, you know, right now the Resource Center, we're actually 22 years that we have been helping moms, dads, families get to the help they need. So with that, we, um, we work with partners, we look to increase resources because it's really important that these families get to educated, solid resources and help. And it can be very sketchy on the internet. So it's really very important that the, um, the families we're hearing from, and this is wonderful progress, that when we first um, started, we would hear from moms and families several months out. They would be suffering in silence. And as time has gone on, we currently hear from families preconception, which is fabulous. So mm -hmm. they're contacting us and saying, my mom had a history of postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety. I know I'm at risk. So right now, we are hearing all across the board from preconception. And right now, because of the pandemic, a lot of the issues that families reach out to us um, for even ampli amplified further. 
So we are getting um, calls as well as online contact um, reaching out to us because due to COVID-19, we expanded our services to seven days a week for the past several, for the past several weeks. So uh, we are hearing from um, pregnant women, birthing persons who are um, terrified and they are afraid of what kind of support can they have at the hospital. Can they have that doula support there for them? Can, um, who's going to be home with them afterwards? There's a, a lot of fears about the virus um, affecting themselves personally. We are helping a lot of moms who have tested positive. And then the, um, the other main issue is domestic violence. That was actually one of the very first issues that became amplified with um, families reaching out to us. So sheltering in place with um, a partner who could have been abusive previously or a lot of stress and a lot of isolation issues. So we're hearing from a lot of moms, families all across the board and we are here to help. And what's really most important is that families in New York State know that there is help and hope available to them. Thank you, Sonia. It's really, uh, you, you bring up a, a, an important point, which is that um, during this pandemic, uh, everything is intensified, right? Mm -hmm. I think anxiety has ratcheted up and there's a new baseline for all of us. There's been a lot written about sort of, um, you know, even providers and frontline, um, you know, healthcare professionals who are struggling to, to help those in need with their own mental health, right? So I wonder, Lee, if you might talk a little bit um, for just a minute or two about how you distinguish um, between the anxiety of the moment um, situationally, because I think a lot of people are saying like, I can't be having a problem now with my mood or you know, with my um, pregnancy and feeling depressed or anxious or postpartum. We have a pandemic going on. So how do you distinguish how do you make, how do you understand what's happening for a patient or how can someone understand for themselves? So um, it's a great question. I think it's, I actually think it's the question of the day um, in many respects. Um, and actually, uh, is a, I think it's, I hope it's a good reference for folks, which is uh, in the last few days uh, online, if you just Google it, I did a column on reproductive psychiatry in the era of uh, COVID, uh, which sort of, uh, takes a number of scenarios that we could spend a lot of time uh, reviewing about sort of what's different, how, how COVID has affected the sorts of clinical situations that we see in women's mental health and particularly in perinatal psychiatry. But I wanted to answer your question, Catherine, specifically, which is that I think it breaks out uh, three ways. First, um, uh, pregnancy uh, is associated with normative anxiety. Uh, and so uh, you know, and, and we actually typically do not see those patients, you know, clinically uh, because uh, they're, they're going through their pregnancies and they're sort of experiencing the normal concerns, anxieties. It's developmentally appropriate given such a powerful experience in the lives of, of women and their partners and their families. Uh, but what we've unequivocally seen during the pandemic are women who did not have psychiatric disorders, were not identified as having an anxiety disorder, uh, sort of given this experience and given the fears, whether it be fears of becoming ill, being proximate to somebody who is ill, concerns about what their experience will be in the hospital, um, you know, uh, delivering, uh, uh, switching from uh, real time to virtual visits, even in during their OB visits. Uh, the, not so much now because it was concern, particularly in various states, about not letting uh, partners in. That, that sort of has shifted and loosened, so that's not as pressing, but it's a very different, um, you, know, uh, um, you know, expectation uh, than, than people had uh, going into this, you know, and yeah. so um, we're seeing women, to your question, who uh, now are experiencing levels of anxiety that are reaching the proportion of actually an anxiety disorder, and so uh, we've been very aggressive about treating those women, getting them connected with both non-pharmacologic interventions. There, there are so many uh, 
uh, interventions that are digitally available. Um, and so we've been referring, uh, there's a terrific on, on actually on our website, uh, there's the MGH uh, resource guide uh, specifically around uh, easy, you know, free, uh, easy to access interventions for both mood and anxiety. And so we're seeing women accessing those and also on the way on sort of early on accessing resources uh, like PSI or those types of uh, resources that Sonia uh, oversees. And so uh, that's sort of part one. The other thing which I think in, in my mind is uh, most critical in the space in which I work clinically um, is that we take care of hundreds and hundreds of women a year who have uh, who've been seeing us, they have psychiatric disorders, they're planning to get pregnant, um, or they are pregnant. And in the context of the pandemic, uh, they become either recurrently symptomatic or they're, or, or they're actually uh, relapsed and they're not doing well. And we are very aggressive about treating those women and getting them uh, well. Our goal is to get them well sort of before they're fully uh, symptomatic, fully syndromal, because we want to keep them out of the hospital. I, I don't even want them. I don't want them to go, uh, you know, into the hospital and and uh, and put. And they have anxiety about that, or understandably so. So I I got asked during a, another webinar a couple of weeks ago, "What are you doing?" And I said, "I just think that we're trying to use telehealth." Actually, someone commented here even this morning, "We're trying to use telehealth to have some more visits." to have um, more contact with these women, and then also to, whether it's pharmacologically, which it frequently is, and non-pharmacologically, to sort of, if they're uh, sort of falling off the curve in terms of their level of well-being, to get them back up on the curve mm -hmm. so that they're well, so that we avoid, uh, you know, perhaps an avoidable visit to the hospital. Yeah, I, I have found it very challenging uh, to treat, particularly women who are, um, I've treated my, <laughs> first, um, you know, milder psychosis outside the hospital because of what's happening, really, with family gathering around and kind of functioning as their own inpatient unit because the fear of going to the hospital was so much a part of uh, what was happening during this time. I mean, no one, no one can go for care, right? And um, it's really been frightening, and I, I worry so much that the floodgates haven't even opened yet, that, that the first wave of kind of shock, shock um, when this pandemic began, that nothing mattered but, you know, coronavirus and if you were gonna be, you know, get this illness, um, and we're still in that phase to an extent, right? But I think that, that no, people were really not seeking care. Um, I keep talking about this article uh, in the Times not long ago, where did all the heart attacks go? You know, where did all the, peanuts go? Where did all the women who were suffering, where did all the illnesses that were happening routinely all the time go? They weren't going to the hospital. They weren't going to the ERs. They weren't going for care because it was too scary. Yeah. My, hope is, my hope is that, you know, people using resources like Sonia's and Wendy's will realize that they need to get their care amped up yep. um, because yep. um, to, to your point, it is just so critical. And I, I actually, I agree. I think we're only seeing the early part right. of that wave. Um, and when I'm, I'm talking about wave of, with respect to COVID, I'm talking about the wave of either, you know, women who've sort of been just holding on and teetering yeah. and could in a way become much more ill. And so I think it's really important for those, those of us who have, uh, in a way, who can reach those populations to let them know that uh, now is the time to get care. And I'm so relieved that 85% of MGH psychiatry has gone to telehealth. Yeah. So we have laid out the infrastructure as a field, not just at our hospital for you. And, and certainly, uh, Wendy, I, I don't know as much, Sonia, what goes on at your place, but uh, Wendy, I know at your place, uh, the in increasing use of telehealth platforms allows us opportunities to sort of tr track those women so that they don't get sick. I agree totally. We talk, um, we've been talking at PSI about doing our part to flatten the second curve, not the curve of the virus, but the curve of mental health reactions, because I agree as well in PSI, we're observing that beginning, um, you know, in the beginning of March, uh, kind of in terms of our 800 number, the front line kind of actually stayed quiet. And it concerns us very much. And it's exactly what you said, Catherine, is that people went into survival mode and the people who need the help most 
are in fight, flight or freeze, and there's a lot of freeze. So we know, we all know right here, and this whole day is about this, is that we will see, we predict the, the result of that is increased symptoms of stress, um, depression, anxiety, and more serious symptoms of, um, as well, all are at risk. So we're doing all our part. In a way, we, I think um, Maternal Mental Health Awareness Week today is World Maternal Mental Health Awareness Day. The whole month of May could not have happened at a better time for this purpose of raising awareness, reducing stigma, saying let's talk about it. Because um, the good thing about, as, as you said, Lee, um, at our place, you said PSI at our place, the cool, the cool thing about our place and Sonia's place is we've always been virtual. Um, not virtuous always, but virtual anyway, um, and, and virtuous. So we've always been using these online platforms as they develop. We haven't had to learn a lot of new things. We know how to reach people who are afraid to leave their house. We already do that. So what we've, what we've done to use the word of 2020, we've pivoted to do a lot more training with teletherapy and training therapists to use teletherapy. Our annual conference is gonna be completely online and all of that. But in terms of reaching families, we all, we know how to do this part and working together. I think we really will um, have some, we will all together be able to prevent uh, further crises that are, that are at risk of happening throughout the year. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I am going to, now that I figured out where the questions are, <laughs> um, I am going to uh, ask you all from the audience um, some of the questions that are being um, put up on the Q&A. Um, so one question uh, that I think is, people always want to know is, what modalities of treatment have been shown to be the most effective at um, combating uh, PMADs? And, um, I don't know who wants to start with that. Can, well, I, can I start? Can I start? I, I, I want to have a plug in here. Uh, Dr. Note next, um, we quote her, social support is the cornerstone to recovery from perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. So what we find is uh, medical, therapeutic, social support, including the relationship with the, um, the infant, but what we find at the Postpartum Resource Center of New York, um, moms who are struggling, dads who are struggling, if they are missing that social support piece, they really feel all alone, and getting connected to social support can be that difference of giving them hope. So that's from our um, experience. Love that. Anybody else want to weigh in? Well, I know there, there are more questions about psychiatry. So before Lee answers all those good questions, it's such a great overlap because I, would, I, I love how Ruta Nunai says that. And I love that you really made sure to say that first because part of the treatment team is actually the family. Mm -hmm. And um, the social support not only provides that connection, but holds their hands when they're moving into other treatments like psychotherapy and psychopharmacology, where they can call us back and say, but really, I mean, should I be feeling this on the second day? Should I go back to him? And where we can help with that, Sonia, and I love that you started there. So um, I just wanted to echo that and say that um, we, there are lots of evidence-based treatments come to one of our trainings and we'll teach you about it, interpersonal psychotherapy, CBT, and, and the important thing is to recognize that it works in conjunction with the others, but also that you can use elements of that in many different professions. So someone wrote in about military support, for example, and home visitors, and they can use elements of CBT in that. So segueing to Dr. Cohen. I think we, um, you know, we have more and more tools. Um, and we have pharmacologic tools, uh, whether it be for depression or anxiety, whether it be um, SSRIs or, or other um, or mood stabilizers for patients with uh, bipolar disorder. Um, and, uh, and we're very interested actually in the combination of pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic interventions. You know, one of the things that I've wondered about, we know 
that in seriously ill women, women who've had multiple episodes of major depression, who are on antidepressants, uh, that if you stop those antidepressants uh, during pregnancy, there's a very high risk for relapse. And we were always interested, and we now have an opportunity to study as part of an NIH grant, whether if you added an intervention that was non-pharmacologic, like mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, could you mitigate risk for a relapse by sort of combining it? And sort of we're doing it in a very rigorous, systematic way to answer those sorts of questions. Because I think ultimately, in fact, I was so pleased when Wendy invited me to speak at PSI at the meeting last year, and I got to sort of see um, sort of people who are absolutely frontline in terms of taking care of perinatal uh, w women with perinatal uh, psychiatric disorders. Um, I was so sort of heartened because you sort of realize immediately that it's going to require a lot of expertise uh, in psychopharm, in uh, CBT, um, and also to Sonia's point, you know, in terms of mobilizing um, social support. And so we're curious to see if it's sort of what what is the formula? What's and, and it may not be one size fits all, but what are the tools that can be sort of combined to maximize the likelihood that women can either get well if they're ill or stay well if they're well, so that they um, so that they don't uh, uh, relapse. And I will say that at least as a perinatal psychopharmacologist, we have more data on the reproductive safety of the medicines that we're using to treat psychiatric disorders than we do for about 95% of the medicines that women just take during pregnancy. So it's always a reference point for me uh, because when you think about SSRIs, uh, we know more about SSRIs than we do for any medicine uh, that women take during pregnancy with the exception of prenatal uh, vitamins. And so, um, so I think we're actually uh, more empowered. Uh, I think that uh, our next, uh, one of our next tasks is from a systems level is to figure out, and it really comes from with our, working with our colleagues in implementation science, because there's also a terrific question in the chat about how do you provide these tools and these opportunities to get well to uh, women uh, and families in underserved uh, you know, communities. And so I think it's gonna be figuring out how to also deliver these services uh, to people who uh, have trouble accessing them in more sort of standard clinical settings. Nothing like a pandemic to help that pushes us all virtual and creates far greater reach than we ever imagined. <laughs> Right, and obviously there are issues with that. Who can can gain access? But I think that the the likelihood is is greater, um, and hopefully will will create more opportunity. Um, one question that I thought was interesting was about um, answering about partners. Right, what are what are one or two key things that partners of expectant mothers or new mothers um, can do to look out for symptoms and support the new mom and their mental health? This gets asked a lot. So I don't know who would like to start. We just have a couple of minutes left. Wendy? <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> First of all, remembering that not every uh, pregnant or birthing person has a partner. Always take it out. But if um, partners of, of pregnant and postpartum people, um, first of all, the same thing we say to people going through it, you're not alone. It's not your fault. And also, you're not the cure. So everything you do as a what we say to partners is remember that if this there really are symptoms, she isn't herself. That's the whole point. It's not she's not trying to do this to you. It's not her fault. And and I we always say take care of your own needs. Reach out for support and giving messages to your partner who's going through it. Um, of I know you'll get through this. I have confidence in you. If um, I, we have a whole uh, handout on tips to help partners with, you know, the kinds of language that we try to tell partners to do is to say, you know, I'm here for you. We will get the help we need. And I believe in you. And then if you need a break, take a break. Um, but also to find a way to get support for themselves. So for example, PSI has a dad's chat. We have lots of information for partners and it's absolutely part of the treatment team. And, and you know, when we do consults, Catherine, we do 1200 new consults a year for women either planning or uh, who are pregnant. And one of the, I think um, sort of the, the, the uh, extension of Wendy's comment is 
we look to partners also to convey information to us because they're with their, uh, you know, they're with their wife and, um, uh, and or partner or, or um, and we feel it's very important that, that we get permission you know, when we do these consultations to, uh, to so that if, if the partner thinks that, that the, you know, for example, if we're seeing a patient and uh, someone's getting ill, we really want to make sure that we get permission to get that information because when we do get that information, we can intervene early. And so uh, for me, I think that it's not only a partnership between the patient and her partner, but it's actually a partnership between the partner and us as, as clinicians. And so we want to fold those folks in uh, because we think it optimizes the opportunity uh, to actually keep those women well and, or get them well. Excellent. Well, on that note, I see that the uh, second group of panelists are joining us. And so I just want to say thank you immensely to, to Wendy Davis, to Lee Cohen, to Sonia Murdoch. You guys are the bomb. You are really setting the stage, have been leading the way, and all the information about your organizations um, will be on a page associated with, it'll be on our website, uh, motherhoodcenter.com. And uh, all the information about the resources mentioned will be there um, so that we can get to all of your website and information about the um, resources and things that you're offering because it's, it's truly amazing. So I can't thank you enough, Wendy, for getting up early and the rest of you for being here at a still early hour hey, and joining thanks us. For, thanks for inviting us and stay safe, everyone. Yeah, it's so Sorry, great guys. to see you all. Thank you so much. Really. Thank you. Thank you. you. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Sonia. Bye, Wendy. Take Bye. care. Wow, what a great panel um, that was comprised of experts in the field of maternal mental health, really setting the stage um, for uh, this, this growing army of work uh, that continues to be accomplished um, to tackle this very important issue. Um, we're going to transition now to our second panel. For those of you that were not with us from the very beginning, um, anything that you did miss, we are recording today's three and a half hour webinar. It will be available on our website by the end of this week, and you'll be able to go back and, and see anything that you missed. Um, we will also host an entire page for this event with bios and information on all of our speakers in the event that you missed me reading their bios or if you want to reach out and contact them and learn more about the work that they're doing. And thank you all for submitting your questions. Unfortunately, we were not able to get to all of them, uh, but when this event is over, we will go back in and reach out to all of you and respond to the questions that we were not able to get to today. Uh, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna transition to panel two, which is called the challenges of becoming a mother in the time of coronavirus. Uh, for those of you who are just joining, my name is Paige Bellenbaum. I'm the founding director of the Motherhood Center. Uh, and I wanna encourage all of you that are staying or just joining for this panel, if you do